Mount Sinai Arabia Research Institute presents to you overwhelming evidence to the path of the Hebrews after crossing the Red Sea. Though many are familiar with these Arabian locations, this research team adds validity to those points of interest while revealing new undiscovered sites. Like the location of the priests' dwellings. The never identified place of sacrifice at Moses' altar. The never seen before water flowing behind the altar area. Something the team's translators couldn't believe when they saw it for themselves. The never seen before purest Hebrew inscription believed to have been inscribed by Moses himself in a small cave directly facing Mount Sinai. The Furnace Ridge, where the articles for the tabernacle were forged and fashioned. Here they found a literal two-piece mold believed to be for the angels that sat on the Ark of the Covenant. Not far from the furnaces, they found a small clearing that matches the location where Moses could have set up the first tent of meeting away from the congregation. The team continues to find evidence confirming these locations and those describing the rebellious events. Like the never seen before Snake Rock, giving the detailed account of Numbers chapter 21 verses 4 through 9, where Yahweh sent fiery snakes upon the Hebrews because of their complaining and was healed by looking upon a copper snake that hung on a pole. A high place showing Hebrew inscriptions with pictographs of hunting and images depicting their moral decline. Many know the altar of the golden calf, but have overlooked the petroglyphs of that event directly across from that very altar. Locations supernaturally preserved for over 3,000 years, now shouting the evidence to the fact of the scriptures being true. When this event, we were asked to be a part of it, I was like, this is going to be crazy. And I don't know about, we, you know, first of all, this presentation you're about to see, we have, we worked how many hours was it yesterday? I mean, like, we're talking like 10 hours yesterday, both of us sitting together at a desk, look at this and this and this, this. And even with all that we did, we're not even scratching the surface of what we saw what we experienced, all the pictures. We, I mean, Nadia alone took over uh, 1,800 pictures, and each one, yeah, there were some duplicates here and there, but I mean, each one had a story behind it. This is our team, and that being said, it was so cool about our trip that was each person had a speciality to them, but even then, we realized how all of us complimented each other and even challenged each other in our own specializations. We challenge each other in that. It's like, oh, your specialty is this. Okay, but I think you're wrong because. And we learned how to do that in love. And thus, we all grew from this trip, let alone learned from this trip. Um, for the introduction of each team member, uh, Misty's going to take it over here, and we'll go from... Now, this, what you're seeing here, we're actually at the Red Sea crossing. So, Misty, you want to take over from here? Yeah. Uh, so... Generally, when I sit through presentations like this and they just ramble through and there's a whole bunch of people that I don't have a clue who they are. So we wanted to introduce the team to you, um, starting with Pamela, Pamela Lorian. Uh, many of you have met or seen Pam before. She's been with this fellowship a couple of times, once at Sukkot and one um, in Rogers. She put this team together. Um, and this, is her, this was her fifth trip to the mountain. She's already scheduled to go again in the fall. Her specialty is the Hebrew inscriptions. And she says that there are two things that she thinks about every single day, her late husband and the mountain of God. This is Dr. Johannes Zalecki, our team archeologist and geologist. He has also dealt extensively with ancient Arabian scripts. Johannes is originally from Ethiopia, where according to Rhonda, he is a celebrity. She says you can't even walk one block down the street with him without being stopped by fans who want his autograph. 
He's been on archaeological digs most of his life, with a lot of time spent in Russia and Ethiopia. He's currently a research professor at George Washington University and a research associate at the Smithsonian. Um, I would like to add here that it's very important to have an archaeologist on your team. Um, it gives credibility to the expedition. Even though so many things have been found before, they just don't carry the weight without an archaeologist name with it. And so much more is found because of him. We, we're looking at something, we go, ooh, look at this. He goes, that's just that's a rock. A rock. <laughs> you know? <laughs> we go, oh. <laughs> and then we'll pick up some uh, whatever. He goes, no, 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 wait. What, what look at that is. We're going, yeah. oh, hey, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. And it's cool because he speaks multiple languages too. So it was really, it was fun being with him. This is Dr. Tommy Coley. Tommy has a doctorate in biblical history. Um, what's awesome about Tommy is his enthusiasm for God's word. It's just infectious. And bubbling joy. Yes. He is a pastor and he teaches two, um, he teaches Bible history at two junior colleges. Uh, with a college-age son myself at a Christian university, I couldn't, be, couldn't help but be jealous because I'm thinking how fortunate this guy's students are to just have him bringing all these stories to life in the classroom because he just exudes the joy of, of the word. Mm -hmm. Rhonda Sand, this was our tour guide and logistics coordinator for all things Saudi Arabia. She has made countless trips to the mountain. She can't even count. It's like over 100. Um, and the country's only been open for five, six years, mm -hmm. and she's been that many times. Mm -hmm. Her connections and knowledge of the country and the relationship with its leaders, they know her by name. They know her in yes. the government. Yes. Um, it enables us to move around easily um, with tour guides and translators. Her Bible knowledge and her love for Jesus and the truth of his word is poignant. She is the type of person that knows how to get things done. It's so funny because with all the trips that she's been on before, she even said that our, our team was like one that just got so much more done, found so much more, and she was amazed by this one trip alone. So I thought it was crazy cool. But she did say every trip, I mean, and they take multiple a year. Mm -hmm. They're fine. It's so unexplored. And they find something new. Every trip, they find something new. Mm -hmm. This is John Oscar. He came on board at the last minute, so it wasn't until arriving in Saudi that we began to get to know him. He's originally from the Netherlands, but now resides in Utah and has a background in computer science. He also led to some helpful discoveries that we'll talk about in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And this photo of him was taken the day the three of us climbed to the top. Steve Mutria, of course, needs no introduction, but it should be told that he has two nicknames. The boss, for obvious reasons. But you put a camera in his hand and it gets worse. I mean, he is telling everybody where to go and how to do it. Um, and be quiet. <laughs> yes, I heard that a lot. <laughs> be quiet. Um, and collagen man. And we'll come back to that later. There's a whole story with that. Am I blushing? <laughs> but all kidding aside, Steve was on a mission to get every shot he could and make the most of our limited time in this place. But all of his video he put all of his videography skills to work to bring you all great content. And of course, his knowledge of the scripture was invaluable in aiding new finds, interpreting the things we saw, and then expanding the knowledge of all of us that were around him. Nadia Mutria, once again, this young lady doesn't need much of an introduction in this crowd. However, she is very quiet, so some of you may not know that she loves to travel, and she loves new experiences, and aspires to be an archaeologist. So she was excited to meet Dr. Zalecki, and uh, she was thrilled with the opportunity to be on this team. She's a very creative photographer and shot all of our drone footage, and we were so glad. Um, I will say, Nadia and I, in the beginning, we were like, dude, do we need three camera people? Like, are we just, we were just excited to be there. We're like, they can take however many they want. We're just glad we're going. But we thought maybe we were a little superfluous. You know, that's Satan trying to get the best of us. So we were super glad to have three people on our media team because there was a lot to do. And speaking of that, the video you saw, all the drone footage was Nadia's recording too. And you. Misty Farmer, the third member of the media team. And again, just so thankful to be like riding those coattails and being there. Um, not to mention being a part of a wonderful expedition team. It's amazing how much I learned in just one week. The first, the first place we stopped, I didn't even know what we were looking at. I just knew my job was the camera person, and I'm just clicking photos. I, I mean, I didn't know. Um, we went to the Snake Rock the first day. When we went back to Snake Rock the last day, I'm like, oh, these squiggles mean something. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was just amazing how, when you're immersed in it, how much you can learn in, about so many things in just one week. And yet, it's funny, 
Um, I've come home with more questions than what I started with. His mysteries truly have no end. Amen. One more picture of our team at this time. Um, this is us taking a lunch break outside the Golden Calf Altar area. Our guides and drivers took such good care of us. Um, I don't know. It's not a touristy country. I don't know. It's not like I would show up there and just rent a car in a hotel. That would not work. Um, so Rhonda took care of all this. Our guides slash drivers, um, they drove, they interpreted, they made sure we had lunches and snacks every day. Throughout the week, we had two drivers every day. We had two, what were they, land cruisers that we mm -hmm. drove? Mm -hmm. And so we had two carfuls, so two drivers every day, and a total of five drivers throughout the trip. One was named Walid, and all the other four were named Ahmed. And Ahmed. <laughs> so how we, knew, how we could differentiate them, we had Neckerchief Ahmed, we had Combat Moot Ahmed, Combat Boot Ahmed, Cousin slash Brother-in-law Ahmed, don't ask, don't ask. and Tiger Ahmed. He's sharing an edible plant with us. Don't remember what it was called, but it was delicious. This is in the Moses Altar area. Mm -hmm. He was with us all week while the other driver changed every couple of days. And the day we climbed the mountain, we were surprised that he accompanied us. He went with us and the guide to the top. We found out later um, that the day prior, Johannes asked him, Hey, have you ever been to the top of the mountain? You haven't been because you're a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> to which Ahmed, he's, he's younger, he took the bait and was like, I am not a chicken. I am a tiger. He did. <laughs> <laughs> so he did make it to the top. He basically ran to the top. So from that point on, the rest of the week, he was known as Tiger Ahmed. Ahmed. Right. Yeah. He, so, and, he, and he wore that proudly. He did. So now you know all the characters. On with the rest of the slides. On with the rest. In case you didn't know... Saudi Arabia is doing a project called NEOM. If you have not heard of it, just Google it, and you'll start finding endless amount of information about it. It's been going on since 2017, introduced in 2017, and initially construction almost started immediately. And from there, I want to show you exactly where NEOM is at. This next slide shows Saudi Arabia. You see it, and then on the upper left-hand corner, right next to the Gulf of Aqaba, you see this square where NEOM is at. There are several present uh, projects in NEOM itself. One is the line, that's the big long red line, go figure. And then one is called Sanbala, Oxagon, Trajina, and there's many other projects that have even been introduced since then. This is an image that they're making the line. Now, for what it's worth, to show you how long this is, it is going to be over 105 miles long. That's two buildings side by side. Each building, if I'm not mistaken, I forgot to get the exact uh, parameters on it, but it's actually each building stands over an Empire State Building tall. Okay, and they're connected in between. They're not just two buildings side by side. They are actually intertwined and connected in between. As you can see in this next slide, this you'll see that will be how we will be connected. The next project they have is the Oxagon. This is basically a floating port city and it is going to be extremely extravagant. The next one is Sanbala. This is basically a resort for billionaires. If you don't have a bee in front of what you own, you won't even get to look at this thing, let alone be there. The next one is what we would consider more um, of concern for us, and this is Trajina. Trajina is actually going to be a winter ski resort, believe it or not, in Saudi Arabia. Now, it does get cold in your late uh, November, December, and into January, but now it doesn't stay cold very long. It'll drop into your below freezing easily overnight, very easily. Now, how cool will it stay during the day? That I have not studied. This next slide, you actually see a resort with the slopes on top of the building. This is in the process of being made already. So this is what you call, oh, and by the way, this, um, they're planning on hosting the Winter Games there of 2029 right here in Trajina. Okay, in 2029, this building will be, it's supposed to be up and going in 2029. Next slide, back to the overall uh, schematic of things. So this is NEOM. This is what they, I know, by the way, NEOM actually means new future. This is what they're doing. They're making the new future. Now let's take a little closer look. If you look at the top dot line, you'll see the, that's where Georgina is, right smack in the middle. Now, I mean, I'm going over my notes. That's a ski resort, correct, that's Trajina. If you look at the top left, okay, the golf, you'll see the Nueva Beach, and I don't have a, a pointer to it, but you can see it to the top left there, right, Nueva Beach. Now, so that gives you the identification of where we're discussing it. So that means they're building Neom encompassing all around the location where Yahweh led his people by way of Moses, because you get the Red Sea crossing right there. 
to just to show you how close this is, let's go to the next slide, and you'll see it overlapping. Now, that little red uh, triangle you see there, that is Mount Sinai. That blue circle is actually the, the massive plateau area of where the children of Israel would have been encamped right there at it. Now, I'm going to be leaving Mount Sinai. Yep, now you can see just how close Mount Sinai is to Trajina. Now, the problem with this, and it, now let it be known, Neom is a cool thing. They are making some cool things about it. I make no bones about it. It's cool. But it's also coming at a very high price. Um, our first location that we went to was about 20 minutes outside of Tobuk, which is where we landed inside of uh, Saudi Arabia. Just on the edge of that official perimeter of Neom is where we, were, we went to first. The images that you're going to be seeing are most likely not there right now. The reason why we went there first is because they were slated and bulldozed over. Now, this is what we saw all the time. We saw trucks. This is a, a weightlifter helicopter. We never saw it in action. I wanted to. Um, you see me standing next to this, this huge pipe, at least three foot, maybe even three and a half foot diameter. This, these pipes were everywhere. I'm talking not just hundreds of miles. I'm talking thousands of miles threaded all over throughout all of Saudi Arabia. And this is the construction they're making, con they're doing constantly. Now, to discuss some funny things we've had here, I want to let pass the baton back to Misty here. So this is for the kids or the kids at heart like me. So here at home. We have school crossing signs. What's that one, kids? What's that one? Somebody, deer crossing, right? We see those everywhere. Well, in Saudi, you have camel crossing signs. <laughs> it's real. It's um, real. <laughs> <laughs> those are wild camels. There are some camels basically free range, but they have um, plastic chains on their front legs so that they can't get away very fast. But these didn't have chains. These are actually wild deer or <laughs> camel <Camels>. crossing. <laughs> um, but wait, there's more. There's also, the, we found a pipe crossing sign. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, but we thought it was funny. And Steve had been trying to get that picture you saw a moment ago where he's standing by the pipe like the whole week. So I the was. pipe crossing sign was pretty funny. It meant funny. something to us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we can start showing you even that first location that was by now plowed over, we want to give you some basic understanding of some un understanding. Before we go any farther, you need to understand this. The importance to identify how the Hebrew language has morphed over the years. And to do that, I'm simply showing you number seven. This is number seven we all know, okay? But it's all under different, uh, help me out, fonts. Thank you. This simply, you see a, a two lines making a seven. Then you see a, a little leg coming down on it. Then you see a leg going down and up on the seven. Then you see a, back to the straight lines with the cross in the middle of the seven. Then you see the line top and bottom over and down and across. So it's like, but you look at this, if you look at this, one of these numbers, you're going to say, well, that's number seven, duh. No big deal. But this is what it's like when you're do dealing with the Hebrew language over time. It has morphed. This is the ancient Hebrew cough. Now, this is, means palm of the hand, palm of the foot. In fact, because of the, you see at the base, the, the two outside, they almost kind of touch. Well, if you look at your palm, you have a finger out here and then the finger out there, and you get the split in your palm, thus the palm of the hand, palm of the foot. Wherever, that's what that basically means. Well, over time, this cough has morphed, and these are the next ones you're going to see. Eventually, the, the bottom line connected, and then they completely did away with the bottom line. It did three straight lines, and they connected those three lines and made a, kind of a Y, if you will, and put a line in the middle of the Y, and you can see how it's morphed. Now, the last one on the right there, that is the modern-day cough. Now, even in, with this, the modern cough has three variations. This one has a dot in the middle, and then basically an upside-down uh, capital 7 uh, L, if you will. So those right there shows the variations of how things have changed over time. Now, granted, it's the same language, spoken most likely the same, but written differently. So you basically have to know these different this language over time, which means you're learning seven, eight different languages, all the same language, but you got to learn how it's written each time. So when you're looking at something, you can say, well, if you only know the old ancient petro uh, petroglyphs, you might see one a thousand years later. It's the exact same thing of Hebrew, but because you don't recognize it, you only studied this one, you're going to miss it. That's what was so valuable for us having Pamela there. She goes, oh, no, 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 that's this. And we're going, oh, okay. And it, like, like Missy said, that first day, we were all learning left and right. Just in case, um, some, some people here might not know what a cough is and what that represents. Good call. Sometimes we forget that there's steps <laughs> that, that we already knew. Yes. Um, I think I first learned about the cough um, 
when I watched a Caldwell video. I don't know how many of you guys have seen Jim and Penny Caldwell. And they had found all these inscriptions um, many years ago when they were in Saudi. And they brought someone with them on one of the trips. And they were all excited about the inscriptions. But what he saw and what he was excited about was the actual coughs. He's like, this, this is what's huge because there can be lots of inscriptions, but what, what was the promise? You probably know it better. It's in Deuteronomy where Yahweh eventually said to them, everywhere you place your foot, I will give to you. So and they so would you, trace you their foot. You see coughs everywhere. Yeah, so they would trace their foot or their hands. Sometimes there's toes. Those are my favorite. They look like Flintstones. Um, sometimes it's like a sole, like these ones right here. Um, but then eventually it became shorthand. And so that's what he's showing you. I just want to make sure in case there are some of you that are younger or haven't, this is new information, that you understand how important the cough is. Um, it's more than just an inscription. Only the Hebrews would have been making this inscription. Thus, anytime you see a cough with inscriptions, you can identify it. Somehow this is directly related with the Hebrews. Here you see uh, the coughs on both sides of the rock around the corner. You see this other one. You actually see two feet inscri inscribed. Those are actually Pamela's feet because this is the one she pulled out of the trash pile. Oh, the rock. This in the is trash litter. This was all shoved to the side where the bulldozers were, so it was all getting ready to just be Pushed buried away. under. So, and, and please remember, um, in the Quran and, and in many of, of the their ancient writings, they have Moses. They have these stories but from their perspective. Okay, so they don't deny it. It's simply they're wanting to wipe. I don't say they want to wipe away. They could care less about seeing Hebrew inscriptions anywhere. That means nothing to them. The, everything else, sure. The, the mountain, the sand, the other, yeah, we believe it. Give her the Hebrew stuff. It's kind of where it's at. And that's why there's an urgency in all of us, especially after going there all the more, like we've got to get these things documented, pictured. We know it was there. Because once it's gone, it's gone. This is at the cemetery. And this is actually a prime example of seeing two coughs from different eras of almost, but used at the same time, like the number seven I showed you, all the different sevens, you see it, you know it, but they're different. Here's two coughs side by side. And in case you can't see it all that well, I'm going to put over scribed of it. You'll basically see they're side by side. One is just the three marks, and then you got the palm of the hand, palm of the foot, side by side. And then I'll do it again just so you can take it away, just to show you. Now, I was concerned, even when I was out there, I'm going, I can't even see. I mean, I'm right on them. I know I can see it. But after I took the pictures and stuff, and I'm seeing their pictures, I'm going, it's just not that good. So I got my flashlight out, and you can see with my flashlight, there you can see it. Very plain and simple. It's right there. So the sun was just not working for what we needed. But when I put this light to the side, you can go, oh, my goodness, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. That's a cough right there in front of us. And just to expound on that a little bit more, this was actually at the location of the Battle of the Amalekites behind the split rock, and that particular one. Now, as Misty uh, mentioned, this is why it's so important of knowing the cough, because it's the number one identifier of knowing this was where the Hebrews were. This is not just some Bedouin artwork. These were the Bedouin Hebrews artwork, if, I, if you will. Now, this was our first location we went to. So having all that established... Okay, now we can go on to our first location that we went to. This was the location that is most likely not there. As she said, most of it was already bulldozed, pushed off to the side. We were pretty confident by now that's already gone. So this is the first location. And under one of that big rock, you can actually see, if you look close enough to the middle of the right, you see another Fred Flintstone foot. You see the little toes there, and you see the ibex right there. Now, Pamela and, and them were all saying, oh, this is that, and this is that, and we're going, Whew. We had just got off the plane. I mean, we were still jet-lagged. They didn't even feed us lunch before we went here. I mean, they <laughs> no. thought the bulldozers were, were coming now. So yeah, that was that close. We were just snapping. We were yep. just snapping. Yeah, next picture we have Dr. Zalecki looking at one of the uh, cows right there. I forgot the name. What was the name of that cow? Apis. Okay, yes. So and we're looking at that. And as we're going through it all, we're trying to, you know, just everyone's looking at stuff and going, this could be this, this could be this. And we're just trying to piece all of our thoughts together and make it all blend together. Next one, you see Nadia standing right next to one. And this, and this is one that Dr. Zalecki said, no, without a doubt, this one is old. He even, I forgot what he dated it to. But that's what Nadia is kind of showing you the size of it there. Now, to go on to our next uh, location, we're going to be going to the Red Sea Crossing, and Misty can cover some of that. So this is the Nueva Beach Crossing. Um, we, of course, are on the Saudi side. 
Um, but the hills that you see in the distance over right underneath the sun, that is Egypt. That's where the crossing would have started. This is one of my favorite sites. Um, I mean, for one thing, who doesn't love a sunset on the beach? <laughs> and the sand is pink. To me, um, this is holy ground. When I first, when the Father first opened my eyes to all of this, it was about 17 years ago, and this was the first thing. It was... Um, we were doing a, a prayer and fasting thing with our church, so it was a whole different thing, and I had spent the day fasting, and he just drops this question into my heart, like, I don't know where it came from except for him. It's not something I would have thought about on my own, of just, well, even if the seas were parted, how would they walk through there? I mean, like, the movies don't really address that, right? Charlton Heston, he, you know, they just walk straight through. But if you think about that, it would be like being at the Grand Canyon. There's no water in it, but you're not going to walk through that. You know, they don't just go straight across. Like, oceans have canyons in them, right? Canyons down, canyons back up. So for whatever reason, he dropped that into my spirit. And so I started researching it. I had no clue what I was looking for. But I love Nueva Beach. Um, and I'm going to show you a chart here in just a minute. And I think that's why. is It's because it was the initial thing that got me started on being so excited about the mountain of God. So for one thing for just to catch up in case there are some of you that are younger or this is all new information for you. The biblical description of the crossing site, um, anyone who thinks about it and looks archaeology, archaeologically at what it should be like, knows St. Catharines in the Sinai Peninsula is not it. There's not room. There's no inscriptions. There, there's just not anything there. There's nothing there to nothing, market. Nothing, like zero. When you follow the biblical narrative, which is what Ron Wyatt did, he knew that that was wrong. And so what he did, and I love this, he didn't ask archaeologists. He didn't ask Egyptologists. He opened his Bible, and he followed the map that God gave us. He said, hey, they went here, and then they turned south, and they got entangled in the land. They went through, entangled being like, <laughs> you're going through these two mountains, and you keep thinking you're going to come out, and you keep not, and you just have to keep following that skinny little trail through the next mountain. You have no clue where you are. And then once they came out of being entangled, they're on a huge beach. Let's remember, there were 600,000 men, besides Alone. the women, and the children, and the mixed multitude of Egyptians that came with them, plus all their herds. So we're talking at least 3 million people, probably more, and their herds. So that's one of the reasons we know they wouldn't have all fit at St. Catharines. But also, you have to have a beach that will accommodate that. So when you look for this site, people suggest sites all the time. But in my mind, I know there's a treasure map. I know I can open my Bible and say, hey, I will listen to the site you have in mind, but if it's not entangled on the backside and the ocean on the front side and is at least big enough for three million people in herds, I'm probably not going to be interested. <laughs> so you can literally, like if you pull up your Google Maps of the Gulf of Aquaba, I mean, it's the only one. You can look there and there's just this big blank spot. You've got all these mountains and then you have this big patch of sand. Right on the ocean. Which is, what, three by five miles? At least. Three by five miles. That's, that is the, the, the sand area. Three mm -hmm. by, it's a big, massive circle. You, again, just like she said, look it up on Google Maps, that, the Nueva Beach of, uh, in the Gulf of Aqaba, and you will see this great, big, massive, flat area where they would have ended. Yeah, and it all matches exactly what the Bible says it should match. It's not, oh, well, God didn't really mean that. He meant this, so we're going to... No, this is what he said, and this is the piece that matches. Um, so that's the Egyptian side. And I've explained why that's a big deal for me. Okay, so this photo, this is me and Rhonda. As Steve's shooting and we're watching the sunset, she was letting me share Sabbath with her at this time. Um, but where we're sitting, this would have been on the landing shore. As you can see, it's even bigger, bigger. than the Egyptian shore. Because you've got to have a big enough shore to leave from and then room for that whole multitude after they walk the 9.7 miles. I know you know, Charlton Heston, they do it in like, what, five minutes, three <laughs> minutes? But it was a 9.7-mile walk from the Egyptian side. This was an all-day trek through walls of water. This is what's so cool. Those mountains you see in the background, you think, well, that's just a mile away. Oh, no, 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 no. That is several miles away. You, you know, has anyone ever driven through Kansas and you, all of a sudden you get to start <laughs> seeing the Rockies? You go, oh, we're almost there. Five hours later, oh, we're almost there. <laughs> Yeah, that's how it is. The same thing here. Just because you, they look like you can reach out and touch them, trust me, they're farther than you think. So back to what I was saying when the Holy Spirit dropped that into me, and I'm like, 
who, who even has that question? I've never heard a sermon about that. I've never heard anyone else ask that. But he was steering me where he wanted me to go. So this is, um, well, let me just stick with my script here. <laughs> um, the fact that the incline through this part of the Red Sea is traversable by a gentle incline with no ledges. That in itself is nothing short of miraculous, besides the fact that the geography matches what the Bible says. This crossing site um, has often been referred to as having an underwater land bridge. So if you are educated in all of this and you've heard the whole underwater land bridge like I have, um, let me fix that fact because it makes us sound like morons when you're talking to archaeologists and stuff. That is, in fact, not true. Um, it is, in fact, 2,700 feet deep at the center. That is two Empire State Buildings tall. So it is extremely deep. Um, and I had um, a conversation with an archaeologist on Facebook recently, and that was one of his arguments about it. It's, it's so deep. But I don't know that it matters that it's so deep. What matters is, is can walkable? you get up and down? Is it walkable? So um, this chart is from Dr. Fritz's book. He gave us um, permission to use it. So you see these C charts four different transects through there. And you can see the ledges, right? Like I, back what I was talking about with the Grand Canyon. On the Nueva transect, there are no steep drops, no steep climbs, as is common at all the others. I mean, look at that one at the bottom. How are you going to get some cows up that? <laughs> this part over here. How are you going to do that? How are you going to get me Or up grandma there? in a car. It's just <laughs> not going to happen. Um, in fact, it's a gentle slope up and down with a grade between specifically 5% and at the greatest 18%. So if you translate that to this to common situations, a maximum wheelchair ramp is 12.5%, and that's modern day, okay? National park trail standards are 10% in urban settings and 15% in primitive settings. So even nowadays, in a primitive setting, National park standards are 15%, and the greatest the Nueva gets is 18%. For a wheelchair. That yeah. puts it in perspective. No, that's, no, that's for trails. Oh, right. But my, oh, okay, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Um, so that's by modern standards, much less taking into account the hardiness of an early shepherd king people. Um, next to that, I just love this sunset photo because it's like the reflection of the sun. Literally every day marks the path they would have taken through the water. An ongoing testimony for those who can see it. Amen. Next, we're going to cover Jethro, and that's Moses' father-in-law. These were actually the burial locations of Jethro and his family. We don't know hardly much of the uh, identifications, what cave was for who, but we do know this whole area. Everyone knows Jethro in that area. It's, he is uh, a, patriarch. a patriarch, yes. I mean, they, they know him. And there's a, uh, Going into this area, you have to walk through a small building, and it's basically a little museum, uh, about the size of this room, but they would not let us take any pictures, any photography, of any, any videography. They said, nope, just walk through. We were not even allowed in there. And, but that's, so they hold us, him in high, high esteem. Just for some more pictures, this is just some other areas of it. Again, all of these are, you're walking into the burial areas of this. Next one is another one up on the top of the hill. It was, it was quite the sight to experience it all. The next one you walk in, actually, you can see. We were, I was talking to Dr. Zalecki about this particular one. It seemed as if um, the ones you see right in front of it, this would have been for the children. And then there's actually a room just the equal size of what you see that you're, you're looking at here. That doorway opens up into another room the exact same size, but that would have been for the mom and dad where they would have been buried. And again, that's just more. And just for perspective, you can see uh, that's Tommy and Dr. Zalecki down at the very bottom. And they're still a football field away from us. Uh, the, uh, they're a football field away from where you see those tombs. They look like they're right on top of it, but they're a football field away. It, it was a walk. Again, it's just, the scale was just and it's hard to imagine. Our next slide is where you see uh, Jethro's well. This was where, when you read in the book of uh, Exodus, where Moses saves Jethro's girls and helps them, this was where it happened. Everyone, everyone where he there. Met Zipporah. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> but everyone there knows this is where Moses was at. They know it. There's no ifs. That's why they guard it. In fact, the day we went there, it was completely um, closed off. Our, our guard, our um, yeah, wall leader. I don't know if he was there that day. Even they, they were all Maker shocked. Shift, Waleed. <laughs> yeah, Baker Shift. So anyway, but that was where we're at there. Now, for the next spot, to give you a perspective on a map, Missy's going to cover the next section here. So 
yeah, you might be wondering why are we covering Jethro. It wasn't as exciting as a lot of the other places we had been um, and were most interested in. Pamela took us there for a very specific reason, and I'm glad she did. It wasn't as much fun as the other places, but it just gave us a bearing. You know, it's sort of like, um, you know, I've been to my grandma's house hundreds and hundreds of times in my life, and you maybe have seen pictures of my grandma's house, of the inside of every room, but you don't know my grandma's house like I do. Like, I can be like, oh, you know, that, that one drawer that's in there in her bedroom by the lamp, and you're like, what are you talking about? But I would know because I've been there, right? So when you've been somewhere, it was so nice to just be able to orient yourself to grandma's house, so to speak, of, oh, this is where this is in relation to this. It was, oh, this makes sense. This is how Jethro would have come and visited once they got to the mountain. It's right here, and that's right there. Um, so let me point out just what some of these arrows are. The pink arrow is just showing um, where we were just sitting on the landing beach for the Nueva Crossing site. Um, and we have today's technology. So while I'm standing there, I just put in Google Maps. I mean, we use that every day. And I put in Elam. So the green arrow shows Elam. Elam, if you don't remember, that's where the 12 wells and the 70 palm trees are. That was the second stop after they crossed. Well, Google Maps pulls it right up. It says, this is a 12-hour walk. Super doable. Second stop, 12 hours. Right there on Google Maps. And this may or may not be the route they took. But it is just nice being able to pull up Google Maps and know it's right where it should be. And that's the point of these slides with Jethro and everything is everything's where it should be. We, so Al Bad, that's, and I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, that's the blue arrow. And those are the pictures that Steve just showed you. So in Al Bad are the tombs of Jethro and also the, the well. well down here. Oh, sorry. Uh, where he met Zipporah. And you can also see because then the red dots over here in the center those, that's all the things that happened at the mountain. The golden calf altar, the mountain, the Moses altar, all those things. So you can just see in relationship how, where everything belongs. Another thing that always was confusing to me, and I've heard a lot of debate about it, because it says Moses went to the back side of the desert. And people are like, oh, that means he went to the west, or that went to... No, it has nothing to do with east or west. And it was just so obvious. It wasn't like something you had to think about when you were there. When you're there, you're going, oh, obviously the sea is the front side. I mean, this is an ancient culture. Water is everything. So Al Bad, that's the city. That's where everybody lives. There is nothing out in the desert until Neom came along. So obviously, that's the backside. This is the inhabited side. This is the side with water. It just makes sense when you were standing there. There's not an arrow there, but down at the bottom, um, it's called Inuna, and that's where the Ishmaelites um, are known to have lived. The cemetery is still there. So again, it just kind of gives you a feel for where these ancient peoples were. It's not just something we read in our Bibles. It's something you can put on a map. The other drop pins are going to be covered more in depth as we go through them. But just so you know what they are, the Snake Rock, the Split Rock, the Burnt Peak, Moses Altar, Golden Calf Altar, and the Furnace Ridge. I would like to make a point for the doubters out there. We're not talking about one solitary location. We're talking about multiple puzzle pieces that geographically and historically complement one another when they're seen as pieces of a whole, and they really become come together as a cohesive map. To see the full picture. Yeah. As she mentioned, that top dropper there that's not with an arrow to it, that is the Snake Rock. And for what it's worth, this is our team, as far as we have been informed, was the first one to find it. So obviously we were quite excited. This is Numbers chapter 21 right in front of us. This is Numbers 21 starting in verse 4. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route of the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? Now this is long. This is, in chapter, this is the book of Numbers. We're, we're out here for a while already. And then it says, There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. They're talking about manna. Smack in the face to Yahweh. Then Yahweh sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned we, when we spoke against the Lord and said against you. Pray that Yahweh will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Yahweh said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Uh, anyone who, can, who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake 
and put it up on a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by the snake looked at the bronze snake and lived. So this whole rock is basically a billboard to say, dude, we messed up. Here it is. This is Tommy. And again, when we got here, we're all going, this is that. Oh, my gosh, this is this. And we're all just trying to piece the puzzle together. As we got to it, we started looking at different things a little closer. And then, because at first, we're looking at the, the swiggly lines. We're thinking that's water. We're thinking this. And all of a sudden, we go, wait a minute. Nope, these have heads. This, this, is, this is a water with a head on it. This is a snake. And so slowly but surely, we pieced it together. And then the next slide... Let me take the right, the left slide uh, side of the picture first. If you see the, fir- the bottom arrow to the left, it has a, a line going into a box. Pamela was, this is where Pamela came in awesome. She goes, oh my gosh. We go, what? She goes, this is a bait, meaning a house. That's, it's, the box is a letter bait. You got a snake going into what? The house. The second arrow up top, it's a dalit, an ancient dalit. What do you have? A snake going into the doors. A dalit is a door. They're writing the whole story of what happened to them. On the right side, this is what we had first when we were discussing it all with one another. You see the one with the hands really ex- accentuated. And, and Misty was at first to notice. It's like, it's, like, it's like he's showing special attention. Like they're in pain. Something is taking place. Our first initial thought of this was here he is bitten. And then if you see between the two arrows, um, you'll see a dalit. It's, you see the tree, it almost looks like a cough, the three lighters, but then the, the left one has the bottom L, backwards L. That's a, uh, not a dalit, a gimel. It's a gimel, meaning showing pathway. And then it's a pathway of the snakes. And then it, we thought, then you see him healed standing before the pole with the snake on it. The problem we had with this, and we're all thinking this makes sense, it's a picture, but we're looking at what? American wise. You're going what? Left to right. Hebrew is always right to left. So now, can a picture be drawn that way in any language? Sure. But modern, any kind of Hebrew is most likely always going to be going from the right to the left. And this is where Pamela starts everything off. She was really excited, but she shared with us just this week. She goes, Steve, this is this on the image on the right, you see the three, what we would call a cough. And then you see just the arrow pointing to the squiggly line. Half of it is uh, faded away. But if you were there, you'd be able to see it more better. It's actually a snake. So showing forth what? Snakes where we walked, the place of the foot. And th- that's, that's the start of the whole side. And, this, and then they're giving the whole story. And then next you see the man who was not bitten yet. And then as he continued down the path, he's bitten. And then you go all the way to the other side, and then you show on the uh, left side, if you look at it, you see a box there, the arrow's pointing to it, with a pole, with a circle, and that would be the snake on top of the pole right there. And Pamela had more to share on it, but this is, I wish she was here, she could share so much worth that. But it's, the more we kept looking at it, we're going, oh my goodness gracious, this is just insane. I was the first to, to we're, oh actually, we all looked at it. If you look at the top, it's, it's a... Um, it's a cross with a line over it. At first, I'm going, oh, my goodness gracious. It's like, this is like, this is the sign of the covenant. That's what a cross is, right? And so I'm discussing it. We're all discussing it back and forth. And then the next day, Pam goes, Steve, I think there's more to it. I go, what are you talking about? She goes, well, this is actually an ancient Semek. And now I'm showing you above it. These are the ancient Semeks right there. And again, just as you had the various of the sevens, you got variances of the Semek just the same. And the Semek means to support, even as a shelter, or especially to the lost or the fallen souls, even to bless is what the Semek means. Now, immediately you're going to think, well, why in the world would they make a Semek at the very top of this event? Let me give you some scriptures to consider. Psalm 119. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Psalm 94, 12. Blessed is the man you discipline, O Yahweh, the man you teach from your law. You grant him relief from the days of trouble, Till a pit is dug for him for the wicked. Job 5.17. Blessed is the man whom God corrects, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Are you getting the picture? They're knowing at the very top, in the midst of all this, was Yahweh's blessing of bringing them back to him. Amen? Amen. Lots of debate on Rephidim. And all we can say is, Again, back to the cough. The coughs were all around, just especially on the backside. The, the Battle of the Amalekites was just on the other side of this, and if, as you read the storyline. And the Amalekites were fighting them because of the water that came from the split rock. There's so much I could share on this. When, and Pamela has shared more 
with us and we're there showing how there's multiple dwellings all around it. We didn't get to go to all of them that day, but there's dwelling places that they know this is a dwelling place. This is a dwelling place. Not just Bedouin dwelling places. They know for sure that they've, they, well, I can't say for sure. It's believed very firmly that these were where the Hebrews stayed at in these locations. This is to give you perspective. If you look at the arrows, the top arrow is John, who I, we introduced to you earlier. The um, top left on the right side, I'm sorry, is Nadia, and the little white dot is Misty. So that gives you an idea of just how big this thing is. In the same location, that's the exact same picture. That just shows you how big this rock is. Again, just showing some fun pictures that we got to take there. It was really quite the experience. Here's another place where um, this is Johannes. You know, and all the rest of us are staring at the rock. He's seen the pictures of the rock. He's looking around and doing what a geologist does. And he tells us, oh, there's an underground aquifer here. And we're all like, how do you know that? And he's like, and right he points, here. He points his little <laughs> stick. And you see the little line of shrubs? Those aren't everywhere. There's literally just a line of shrubs. And we're like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, but He said a lot more with that. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and God can make water come out of a rock even if there's not an underground aquifer. But it is interesting when you go to a place and your archaeologist says, oh, well, there's, there's water under, underneath here. And then on the back side, I don't know that we have a picture of it, but he also showed there's a, there's a line of black volcanic rock. It snakes all the way, I mean, for miles up over. And he said that also indicates water. Yep. It was cool having him alone. It was. Next slide. As I mentioned, this is the Battle of the Amalekites. And this is literally on just on the other side of the split rock. Now, the road we traveled on to get here was by car was about maybe a 5 to 10 minute drive, uh, more of a 10 to 15 minute, now that I'm thinking about it. But as we went around it, um, Pamela was saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm going, what? This road that we were on wasn't there this last October. You, when, I mean, it was just a sand road. You're, you're driving over sand, beating down sand. Well, now it's been plowed out, it's been smoothed over, and they're getting ready to put pavement down on it. And, and she goes, Steve, and she's trying to be real quiet to me because of our driver. She goes, oh. I go, what? She goes, we have lost dozens of petroglyphs because of this one road alone just since this last October. So that one road wiped out petroglyphs after petroglyph after petroglyph that's pointing to the Hebrews being here just on our way to the Battle of the Amalekites. And uh, if you, I, we don't have to read it. I guess I'll read it real quick. This is Exodus 17, verse 8. So the Amalekites and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of your men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff, with the staff of God in my hands. So it didn't even take a whole army. They just took just what they needed to fight the Amalekites. And this is where it took place. Now, this next slide is what I really like. You see on the right slide, you see the cough, like we've been said before. And what did we say this other thing was? You, you called it a funky-looking ant. <laughs> I, think, I think it is actually an antelope, and its horns are just kind of wonky uh, yeah. and fused together. There's lots of antelopes. There are, yep, all that. But if you look at this one, we couldn't help but think, oh, my goodness, is this an, a petroglyph of Moses with his arms being held up by other two arms on each side? You can, and this is right in front of that location where you see the Battle of the Amalekites would have fought. And again, this area is, there was construction. I think I got some pictures of it in a second. This area is actually being wiped out. So I'm not sure how long these rocks are even going to be there. This was some cool pics too. Now, all of the, the picture on the right, I'm sorry, the left, is we're finding all of these images on these rocks all over. And that's, that's what you're seeing. And then the picture on the right. That's also the black line I was talking about. That, those black rocks. And they call them, they have a patina. And they like to do inscriptions on those because it's easy to, or to scratch through the black in your inscription to show up. But you see it snakes all the way up that hillside. And that was the other thing that Johannes said uh, indicated water. Oh, for the backside of the, yeah. uh, with the, the split rock. Correct, yes. And you can actually see hunting taking place. And you can see they're hunting with dogs. They used their dogs to corral the animals, and then they corralled the right spot, and they hunt them with the arrows. It was, it was just crazy. And again, you're seeing the cough in the midst of this. So this is Hebrew inscription. They're showing you what they did at this location when they were there. This is the construct, just a couple of the construction trucks. This is right in the midst uh, to the far left of the, where the Battle of the Amalekites was, and they're working their way up that hillside where all those inscriptions were at. So it's really sad to think that it won't be long. Those, ins those inscriptions are all going to be gone. And from here we go to the Golden Calf Altar. I love this picture. I took this as a, a still shot from one of Nadia's drone shots. You see the, the, the burnt 
uh, Mount Sinai in the distance. So this is where it is at in correlation. To, so it's all there. Everything is right where it's supposed to be with this mountain. If everyone says it's not, I'm telling you right here, you can see it's all in the perspectives of where they need to be. I will say something on that. Sure. We did notice the day that we climbed, because there's, there's different debate on is it or isn't it, but again, it's all the pieces fitting together. So when we climbed on that day and on the way back down, when you're coming back down, it's in direct eyesight. I mean, that's another piece of, well, what does the Bible say? What does the treasure map say? <laughs> you know, wherever Aaron's altar is or the golden calf altar, um, it has to be within eyesight because we all know the story. And he got mad and he threw down the Ten Commandments. Then he had to do them himself. Yep. So it's right where it should be. Again, this is images actually on it. Now, there's lots of debate, you're, especially from your um, higher educated uh, archaeologists. Well, Moses couldn't build that. That thing is a natural formation, and it is. You see these, what, that formation of rocks, they're all around. Not that big, per se, right there, especially right there. But right here, it is. And the element of Aaron building an altar, he built an altar. We would think a small altar to sacrifice to it. He didn't bank this. This is what the people inscribed on it in front of it. In fact, we were talking later on, it's like most likely we can imagine the golden calf was placed on top of this rock area, this massive plateau, and then the altar was built, made in front of it, and so thus they sacrificed right in front of where it was all at. Does that make sense, I hope? This is just showing more pictures of it. You can't really see the inscriptions very good on that one. I'm not sure why I used that picture. And, oh, that, oh, it's showing the video. Cool, I guess I forgot I put a video on here, sorry. On this video, you can see, because when you first look at it, you're thinking there's not room in there. This little pathway right there, that's five feet wide. So this, and going over to this section here, that is about 15 feet wide. It's big. It's open. And this is where your extracurricular activities would have been taking place, if you will, if I can say it that way. So all around, this is where, and this is, you see coves, little caverns, and all within it, all the way around. And this is where all that was taking place. I'm not sure how long that video takes lasts. Nope, there it is. And the next slide we have is actually right across, um, was it about a half mile on the other side? Not far? Yeah, you see these images, and... Let me just read my own notes so I don't screw up. This image is a cross from the golden calf, showing what they believed it was all about, celebrating Yahweh providing for them. In fact, you'll see hunting here. You see over there. It's all there. All, but you notice it's the bull is there dominating it. Please know, they were not worshiping other gods. Okay, it was Moses who was missing, not Yahweh. They who was what was Mo, Moses? He was their mediator. He said they said what you go talk to him. And then we'll be back here. And then Moses never came back, up to the 40-day mark, of course. And then so what they do? Moses has died. We need a new mediator. What are we used to? Idols. So they made an idol in the form of what they considered Yahweh, the Aleph. If you look to the right, you have the Aleph. The Aleph is, the, and the ancient Aleph is what? A bull. So what do you see? They make these bulls. They're, they're selling. In fact, the whole account reads where um, Aaron says at the end of it all, tomorrow is a feast unto who? Yahweh. It wasn't another God. They were making, they were worshiping God. It was, it's the classic example of worshiping God your own way and not his way. But I have a teaching on this. You're going to laugh at me, but it's the golden calf in the end times. And that's right there. If you're interested in understanding that perspective, that's what they were doing. Now, with that slide being up, this is where we re, uh, it's recorded that 3,000 people were killed because of this event. But how did they know who to kill? And there's 3,000 amidst all of them. I, I can promise you, when Moses came up and saw all this event, threw it down, he's yelling at them. You think they just stood there and listened to him? They fled. They all ran like, you know, uh, bugs when, when you turn a light on. Cockroaches, yeah, they're like fleeing. So now who do, how do they know who to get? How do they know who to kill? There was 3,000 at least we know. In, in fact, it's Exodus 32, 19. It says, When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hand, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf. Now listen, this is the important part. He took the calf and made, uh, they had made, and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it into powder, scattered it, uh, scattered it in the water, and made the Israelites drink it. You guys, many of you have heard me discuss this already before, but why would he make, do that and make them drink it? 
It's all in the law of the jealous husband found in Numbers chapter 5. In short, if a woman is suspected of adultery, the man is to do this. You go to the priest. He, he writes everything down on a scroll, pours it into the water, takes sand from the, from the base of it, pours it into the water as well. She drinks it, and he declares this. If you're innocent, nothing happens to you. If you're guilty, this is what's going to happen to you. Your abdomen's going to swell, your thighs are going to waste away, and your people will curse you. Okay, so what did Yah- uh, Moses do? He ground it all up, threw it in the water, and made them drink it. So how would they know who to drink or who to kill? Next morning, if their abdomens were swollen, their thighs were messed up, they couldn't even run, so they're, they're sitting ducks. They knew who to kill. Because, and so it's Yahweh keeping his covenant. It's the law of the jealous husband. He, they, just, they were just entered into covenant, and already they're committing spiritual adultery. For more on this, if you're interested, you can go to our next slide. That's where we have was the law nailed to the cross. And that's, I cover that in detail. In our next slide, we go to the cemetery, and that's Misty. So the cemetery, that doesn't seem as fun or sensational as some of the other sites um, when you think of Mount Sinai. However, this is one of the very best proofs that Mount Sinai in Arabia is legitimate. Uh, this area is so remote, remote, sorry, both historically and now. There was never, ever a need for a cemetery of this size And there's no explanation for its existence except the Exodus narrative. Um, An influx of millions and the simultaneous death of a huge number, like we just talked about, the death of the 3,000 in Exodus 32. The fenced area where this cemetery is is 28 acres. That's the size of 21 football fields. It's a very big cemetery. How many burials could be accommodated in 21 football fields? Here you'll find multiple burial mounds. Um, In the picture to the right, the one with the people in it. Um, In the front, you see two or three standing stones. And then behind that, you see a grinding stone, which is also up there. And then behind that, you see a burial mound. Um, As in the case of like the 3,000, those would have been hasty burials. Those are mass burials, and they probably wouldn't have been given honor like a standing stone. So most likely, they figure it was used for the death of the 3,000 with the mounds. But there and there's so many. You can see in the pictures, that's just a handful of standing stones. Um, that would have then become the cemetery. So anything that happened after that, I mean, you've got 3 million people, so you probably lose them Mm semi-regularly. Oh, there's not permission yet to dig. um, But at what point um, one could exhume, you know, Johannes has told us it's very simple. Once you have some bones, you're going to know the age, the time frame it was put there, and the DNA within a matter of days. Yep. And it's interesting, too, regarding the... the the grinding stones, we found those all over. And we did find a few of the arrowheads, but not many. Because arrowheads would be scavenged real quick by locals, without a doubt. But the grinding stones, not much of an interest. But the thing is, it's believed that whenever they were buried from the event of the 3,000, the element of their uh, belongings, personal belongings, would have just been thrown down on the grave out of disrespect. And we saw many of the grinding stones were literally broken in half. And so it's, it's very element that this is where that all took place. To our next slide, we're going to go to Mount Sinai. This place, when I put the word surreal up there, there's a reason. When we were there, it's just like, I can't believe I'm here. And it's been preserved all these years compared to that over in Egypt, like Missy said earlier. And even compared to Jerusalem. You go to Jerusalem, you've got a shop on every corner selling you this. You've got a, a Catholic something over here. It's all been just commercialized. But no one knows about this place, hardly. Yahweh has specifically guarded and protected it for a reason. And I think it's very much because of the end times. Now, Paul references the mountain in Arabia in Galatians 1.17. He said, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Why would he do that? Because he went to ground zero. He knew this is where he had to go to meet God. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it because he... Think about it. This is the guy who used to persecute the Christians, and now he is one. So he's going, he's like, his world has been rocked, and everything he has thought was true is now been like slanted to like, oh my goodness, did I, was I really a part of the, the people who crucified Messiah? And so this is where he went. You can also go to Galatians 4.25, and it even specifically says it even more so. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Not in Egypt, in Arabia. Again, that's Galatians 4.25. 
Why were they in slavery? I can go into that. We, we know that. I don't want to discuss this too long. Going into the local Bedouins have always referred to this mountain as Musa's mountain, Moses' mountain. They, they knew it's always been known as Moses' mountain. What's cool about it is, too, it's Jabal Makla, which means mountain that's burnt. And it's burnt. Now, the question is, is it burnt? That's been the debate. And it was, it was Misty not too long ago we were talking about it. She brought a great point up. She goes, even if it's not like what we would call burnt, she goes, fire from heaven, what does it do? And she said something. And I just go, oh, that is great. She said, it didn't burn up the bush. It was on, it was, it was on top of Mount Sinai. But yet we know it did something because you can see the marking of it there. So now, the burning bush was only there for what? Maybe half hour, <laughs> you know, as far as being burned. burned. But this was a long time. Thus, you see the result of it. Mount Sinai is Horeb, also known as Mountain of God, Jabal Makla, like I said. And now the mountain range is called Jabal Allahs, the whole mountain range. The interesting thing is that actually means mountains of almonds. Now you say, well, what in the world did that got to do with anything? Well, what did Aaron's staff bud? Almonds. What was on the, uh, the menorah? Almonds. So there's a reason for everything that Yahweh has. I love it, too, talking back in about regarding, you know, Paul, how he had to go to, you know, all the way back to ground zero. Same thing as with Elijah. This is recorded in 1 Kings 19. I'm not going to read it. But he's, you know, all of Israel is you know, forsaken Yahweh. And it says he went all the way down to the mountain of God. And he, he was there in a cave. And then Moses, and Yahweh looked at him and says, what are you doing here? He goes, I am zealous for the word of Yahweh. It's like he was, that's what he wanted. And that's the same thing you saw with, Mo, with Paul. I love that story. Again, that's in 1 Kings 19 if you want to go there. Now I say, why would he preserve it? For the end times, I'm talking about Sinai. Isaiah 46.10, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do what I please. There's no doubt in my mind, the battle of Armageddon will be taking place right here at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is actually the mountain of Moed, the mountain of appointed times. In Hebrew, Moed, thus Armageddon, Moed. It's, the, it's Har Moed. In the Hebrew, mountain of appointed times. This is where it's all going to be ending out with. In fact, if you're interested on that, I, can, I have a teaching on Armageddon and the Parousia. You can go and I explain all of that in extreme detail. For our next slide, we're going to go when we started going up the mountain itself. Missy's going to cover that some. So here we are at the top, worshiping Yah and all that he was, is, and is to come. Um, as you can see, we each worship in our own way, some with praise, some on bended knee, and others by collapsing into the arms of the Father. <laughs> <laughs> that was John. It was a rough climb. Um, this was a long day, three hours driving to and from the mountain, five hours up, two hours exploring, and three hours back down. But we made it. Older folks used to tell me that going down is harder than up, and I could not understand that. I'm like, what are they talking about? Um, down is definitely easier. Well, I must have joined the older folks crowd <laughs> because down nearly did me in. It was much harder than going up. My joints did not like it one bit. As a matter of fact, um, I felt like a five-year-old at a skate rink. <laughs> Because my knees were just done, and so I was using my hands a lot. And so I'm grabbing all, and I'm sure it was, Steve was taking up the behind part, making sure I was okay, and I appreciate that. But I know I looked like a five-year-old at a skate rink. Hit pause um, for a second. <laughs> when we were going up, it, was, it wasn't even a hot day. It was maybe, what, in the 70s, low sure, 70s. Ah. When you're 40, it's 40, almost 50, it it's always hot. It wasn't that hot. But anyway, <laughs> what, as the, from where the sun was shining down, you have these big rocks you're going around, and they're shadowed, so they're cool. There's, I, I didn't have the video in here. I got it. It's on my darn. phone. Yeah, darn. darn. And so um, I look back, and here's Miss. She's going, ah, oh, and she's doing this against a cold rock. <laughs> and then, and then uh, just as I look back, she goes, rocks are my friend. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Oh, dear. Okay. okay your turn. Um, <clears throat> you're going on. So my joints. <laughs> Going down was hard, okay? So Steve, who's older than me, I might add, was having zero trouble with his joints. I made the comment that I must not have enough collagen, and Steve, this is when he earns his trip nickname. He goes, oh, it's funny you say that, because I do take collagen every day. <laughs> Thus, collagen man. <laughs> Side note, 
I have come home and I am currently taking collagen. <laughs> no reports yet on if it is helping. <laughs> but in all seriousness, we were thankful to have made it all the way, uh, all the way to the top and made it without injury. According to Rhonda, um, she, she's not a fan when people want to climb because it seems like someone always gets hurt or needs rescued. Um, a few years ago, two people who had climbed Mount, um, Mount Everest had to be rescued with a helicopter. Climb, um, and they're used to climbing Mount Everest, but they had to be rescued from climbing. Yeah. And it's because here. they didn't take enough water. It's not because they couldn't climb it. It's because they didn't go prepared. So our goal, main goal, one of our main goals was not to cause Rhonda added stress and be careful rather than quick and... Praise Yah for his protection. Yeah. And it's not a hike. It's a climb. You, that needs to be understood. It's, it really is a climb. <laughs> Going on to our next slide. This is a pattern. Now, we see the top of Mount Sinai right here to the far left where Yahweh's presence was. And then just to the uh, right of that, you see the 70 elders, which we have some pictures of that in a second. That's where the, all the 70 elders had met. And then uh, a little later over, you see uh, the water and the Moses altar. Right there uh, was the third, the middle spot is the Moses altar. Now, just right, and then on the outside, you see the two, the one with the guy hiking, that is the golden calf altar, and then the far right is actually where the um, furnace. furnace ridge is, correct. So, there's a pattern here, but now, just looking at it, you may not understand it. So, let me go to the next slide, and I'll show you. This is the tabernacle. You see the inner court, the outer court. You see the, uh, the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And then just outside of that, you had the temple, uh, the altar of incense, table of showbread. And then you had the menorah. And then you have the water that would be on the outside. And for what it's worth, I've seen lots of different diagrams. Some say the water was directly in front. Some say it was off to the side. So when they left the altar area, the red box there, they're walking a straight line. They simply turn, wash, and then they continue the straight line. I'm not sure which one it is because when I read it in the scriptures, I never found a specific, this is how it's supposed to be. But I like this diagram because if you go, if you place it over with our next slide, you can see that even on the mountain, the pattern is right there. You see the Holy of Holies. You see the, the, where the 70 elders are at in the, in the inner. And then you have the water. Then you have the water on the, on the mountain. And then you have the next one right there with where they actually have Moses' altar. And then you have the outer courts. It's all right there. Is that not crazy cool? Going to our next slide, you have the 70 elders. This is where the seven. This is, again, so big. In fact, this is the top section of it. Is it, it kind of went down a little bit down that way, and it just opened up. I'm, I mean, how many football fields? Oh, my gosh. It's just crazy. But this is where we believe that was, they actually met. Now, I am one to believe that, the, especially the, uh, the section you're not seeing quite here, but it was massive multiple football fields. I think that's where the 144,000 will be meeting with Yeshua right up at that in the future. But, again, something different. Our next slide is where you see the ultimate, the, the, this is looking down. The far picture on the right is looking down at it. And when you completely turn around and you look up at Mount Sinai, that's where it at. Now, for what it's worth, you look like it's, well, you're right there. Oh, no, you're not right there. <laughs> we were not even quite halfway up yet, and you're, but it looks like you're right there at the top. Next, we go to the altar area. And on the left, you see the cattle chutes. This is, again, for, this is where they would... Uh, move the cattle into the, uh, the sacrificial area. And this is actually taken, this image is taken from one of the uh, still shot from Nadia's drone. As we just put a picture of her there, taking, doing, flying her drone. Real quick, before yep. you move from that slide, um, the cattle chutes. Um, I've done a lot of research even since I've been home. And even the most, the people who are the most critical of this site, um, we mentioned the cemetery already. The cattle chutes is another one um, that aside from the Hebrews, there's just not an explanation for that. It's been said that there are dwellings or rooms, and obviously there's no dwelling that's all long and skinny like that. So that's actually uh, one of the second things that they quote is they have no explanation for it other than the Exodus. This is... Um coming to the end of the cattle shoots, and it's kind of showing you some of the, how it all come to a conglomeration, and, and Pamela could explain this so much better, I don't want to try and do it injustice, but it's the area I want to focus on, it's behind it, because you can see us walking, at, at, oh yeah, right where the tripod is at, to the top of the image, if you can see it very well, that is actually the, the point of importance, because just to the right of that is this next picture. This is something as we were, all of us were walking around, as always, looking for something here, looking for something there. I look down at this, and I go, oh, my gosh. 
And I forget who was with me. They go, what? I go, this is where they slaughtered the animals, right here. They go, what do you mean? And I can only say I know this because I was a part of when we had um, slaughtered a cow for Sukkot one time for people for the we're hosting it there and the guy said you know what we need to go ahead and provide for all these people because they're coming from out of town from out, out of the na- the country and stuff so he goes let's go ahead and we'll butcher a cow right here and well instead of paying for to have it sent off he you know brought some in and to do it and I thought you know what I want to go ahead and watch them butcher this cow I, I've never seen it why would I want to do that I don't know and then as I'm doing it I'm going father why am I here I'm seeing the life of an animal just be taken away from me and it's like it was just a very sad thing for me to to see it. And now I look back at it, though, I know why he had me there, because I can identify this. Whenever you slaughter a cow, what do they have to do? They had to stretch the neck out, and then they would push it down. This little wedge, you see, they would push the the head down right there, and then you see um, the standing rock right here. I kind of, on the right hand, you can see where I kind of put how it would have been before it was broken. So the the chest of the cow would be right there. And also, when we did it, the... in Costa Rica, the guy was telling us, we got to get the cow on his knees. And we're going, what? And so we had to put him on his knees. And then, and then he explained later on, so that way whenever he falls, he simply just, it collapses right there. It's, not a, it's, it's a gentle fall right there. So as I was explaining it, all of us were just, I was so ecstatic to see this because no one has seen this. Before, that we know of anyway, no one has noticed this before. The cool thing about this is, you can see it. Now, this is the side shot. You can see exactly where the cow would have been, or even a lamb, mind you would have been have his chest up against to it, the neck stretched out across, and then if the neck is then pulled out, so it can be slit, the slip would be on both sides of the throat. Now, this is where the big arrow is pointing to that um, rock I just showed you, those two rocks. The big, now if you see just to the right of the arrow, you can see where rocks had fallen. So most likely, a lot of these rocks have fallen from the Elijah's earthquake. If you remember Elijah's in the cave, a lot of these had fallen from that earthquake. And others, mind you, of course. But so that the whole plateau where the, the tripod is standing, that's where they would have then pulled the animal and carved the animal before they go and burn it, sacrifice. Because the Yahweh is very specific. You'll burn this. You'll do this. You'll eat this part. You won't just this be fully eaten. This will be fully burned. So they had to separate it. They had to have a place to do that. And this massive plateau is right where it needed to be, right next to it before they took it back to the altar area. And next is what is crazy cool about our trip is the water. You want to cover next? So below the Moses altar area, there was water. Um, In all the years, so 17, like I said, that I've seen footage and videos and stories and all the stuff of this place, I've never seen water or anything green. (laughs) The cool, um, you know, it's always been brown. Every picture I've ever seen in this place is brown, brown, brown. Have you guys ever asked somebody their favorite color and ever had anyone say brown? Yeah, me either. (laughs) I mean, like, brown is just boring, especially as a photographer. It's hard to take pictures of just brown on brown on brown. So this cool, refreshing stream was like an oasis in this dry and thirsty land. I did not want to leave. Um, For me, water means life. Um, So it was a glimpse a small snapshot for me of what this place could have once been and perhaps will be again. Mm -hmm. Um, Rhonda, who we've mentioned, she's been there like a hundred times and all of our drivers, they have never seen water here before. They were like, like, what? And they went running down there to check it out. They had never seen it. They couldn't believe it. This photo, Rhonda was just in awe. She said, I've never seen a picture like this in this place. Um, This is from the day we climbed. This is just before we got to 70 elders probably. And you can see the reflection of the sun in the stream. That is the water right below Moses' altar. So water, life in the desert. So after Nueva Beach, this is probably my second favorite thing. Like I said, all the pictures I've ever seen are brown. And as a photographer, that's super boring. So (laughs) the very first place we went that day, um, that's where this photo's from. Green at the very first sight. I was thrilled. The guides told us that apparently there had been a lot of rain recently. So we asked them to define a lot. And they said, well, two weeks ago, it rained about two hours per day for four days in a row. (laughs) (laughs) But in an area that only gets about four inches per year, that's very significant. And it was just cool to see how the desert loved it. I mean, 
just that much water from two weeks ago, and this is why, I mean, Nadia and I couldn't stop taking pictures of flowers everywhere. We're supposed to be taking pictures of inscriptions, and we are, but we're like, oh, wait, well, there's a flower. Oh, oh, wait, here's another flower. But it was just awesome to see how that life is there, and it's just dormant, and how quick it is to respond with life to even the smallest amount of water. So like I said, Nadia and I were capturing pictures of flowers. These are some of those. And grass everywhere we turned. Green life bursting through the nooks and the crannies of the desert stones. It was easy to see how with a bit of nurturing rainfall, how this place could be transformed from being a desert into what the Bible calls a wilderness. Because remember, they had herds. They had to eat something. They can't eat rocks. So I love this next slide. Um, Also courtesy of... Dr. Glenn Fritz um, in his book. So this shows, and I don't know how scientists, geologists do all this stuff, but they know what water levels are um, varying by different years. And they know this from the Dead Sea. And if you look at a map, the Dead Sea is directly above Mount Sinai. You've got Jerusalem, you've got Dead Sea, then you've got Sinai down here. So if you look at this, you can tell during the time of the Exodus, you see that big hump? That means there was lots of rainfall. I'm guessing this big one over here was the flood, but I don't know. I haven't looked into that. (laughs) But literally, there is geological proof that during the time of the Exodus, they had a far more than average amount of rainfall. And that's what that spike shows. How cool is that? So I want to read something to you. Next slide. Psalm 68. Listen to this. When you, God, went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel, You gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your weary inheritance. Psalm 68 tells us right there that he went before and brought rain and prepared that place. How cool is that? Amen. Next few slides are simply showing the images of the water right behind the altar. This is obviously Misty. I'm just doing it in the right side there. You couldn't get me out of there. (laughs) She was. It's time to leave. (laughs) She was always down by the water. Which was funny because she always made fun of me because I didn't get the opportunity to go Steve to Steve did not even see the water personally. I didn't. Work, 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 work. I like this next picture because you can see how clear the water is. The water is so crystal clear. It's just, it was awesome. We, yeah. Okay, and from here, we're going to go into the homes of the priests. This is right in front of Moses' altar. There's a real high ridge to the right. And last time Pamela was there, she goes, she started seeing some things, and no one has ever, everyone just goes right to Moses' altar and just starts looking at that, and then they leave. They don't examine the whole area. Well, she did it this last time, and she goes, we need to look at this more. And so we found around, I think it was around 10 to 15 different areas where you can see people had lived. There was locations, like this would be a fireplace that would have seen right there. The next slide. Is another one. We don't know for sure all of it, and I'm just getting a little big. We had so many pictures, folks, I, I, we couldn't show all of them. This one here showed a, a perimeter, and again, this is right all along the whole side of this perimeter, walking towards Moses' altar. Our next one is going to be looking at the Moses inscription from Misty. Okay, so this is a very cool inscription and a testimony as well. It starts with this man, Dr. Zalecki. This is something else that you probably haven't seen um, unless Pamela spoke about it. It's not one of the things that everybody's talking about. Um, But you'll see through the story why it's such a big deal. Um, So I'm going to give you a little background. Johannes, as he prefers to be called, grew up an Ethiopian Jew. And at the age of 10, he was witness to the death of his entire family except his mom. What stands out to me when I think of Johannes is his humility. He refused to be called doctor. Every time we called him Dr. Zalecki, he says, no, no, Johannes. Um, And he was just interested in everyone on the team, just so different than sometimes the air that an archaeologist might carry, um, that they know everything. But he came very dear. He became very dear to all of us. So what also stands out to me is his interest in the truth. There have been many archaeologists, according to Pamela, that have seen the mountain and believe it to be the mountain but they are not willing, they turn away because of the inconvenience that would do to their career if they were to stand behind it and, you know, challenge the traditional things. But it did seem to me that Johannes would follow where the facts point, regardless of popular opinion. Many finds don't carry worldly weight. We kind of talked about that without an archaeologist behind it. So his presence on our team is huge. We really, really need him. 
It also must be said, his innate knowledge is so handy. We kind of talked about that. <laughs> we would think some school, he's like, it's a rock, and vice versa. But with all of this background said, um, it brings us to spring of last year, the trip that we were supposed to be on, and y'all had other plans. But on this trip, y'all brought together Pam, Johannes, and Tommy. And Johannes, I believe, was on the trip. Him and Rhonda have been friends for a long time. Uh, Rhonda has um, adopted children from Ethiopia, and Johannes has helped with all that, so they're very close friends. And she has been trying to get him to come forever, and he happens to finally be on the trip, Never the same one. You, and, and I don't know that he was super interested when he did come, mm-hmm. but... He did it because Rhonda wanted him to. And that happened to be the same trip that Pam was on. He had doubts, no real interest in the mountain from what I understand. However, through a series of less than amiable events that we won't go into now, he would make a new discovery that would challenge his beliefs and move him to tears in response to the everlasting God of the scriptures. So due to these extenuating circumstances, him and Pamela were exploring on their own. They were just doing their own thing, trying to get away from the drama. In last year's. Yeah, in last year's. And they came across this lovely shaded alcove, a great spot for a shepherd's shady lunch. (laughs) Homeschoolers has some nice alliteration there. So in this spot, and I have others, but this one is farther away so that you can kind of see that it's shady no matter what. It's got like this big overhang. And it looks directly at the mountain. So if you're sitting here, what I'm staring at is the blackened top. She's looking right at the mountain there. So here's a closer picture. Pamela is sitting there. Um, And upon closer examination, there is a never-before-reported inscription. Now to me, and you can't probably see it yet, we're going to zoom in. Now to me, this just looks like light scratches. Like some toddler got a hold of some sidewalk chalk. (laughs) Next slide. But that just shows my gross ignorance. Johannes and his study of ancient languages was able to see it for what it was. It is Paleo-Hebrew, the earliest form of Hebrew. And because of the lettering, he was able to notice within seconds the time period that the inscription came from and also knows by the letters that the writer must have been very well educated, which narrows the author down to about one. Moses. (laughs) During this moment, this is the coolest part. I mean, the inscription's awesome. But during this moment, this sacred space where academic reality collided with the overwhelming spirit of Yah, Johannes was overcome as he looked first at the inscription and then turned to face the mountain. He exclaimed with tears in his eyes that this proves this is the mountain of God. There's another slide later that we're not going to get to share, so I do want to share something from it. You know, I just love, um, Teresa and I talk about this a lot, that God, God has his own journey for each of us. And I had a very wise person tell me one time, because sometimes we want it for people so bad and we try and do it for them, but never rob people of God's originalness with them the same way he was original with me. And, you know, those scratches wouldn't have meant anything to me. But for Johannes... That was God whispering in his ear and showing him a small piece of his glory. And other things happen throughout the trip. God is bringing him, drawing him to him. And it's very exciting. But I wasn't able to get a hold of him, and I didn't want to share the rest of his testimony without his permission. So this is the Furnace Ridge. This is also new. Other people have not seen this. And this would go in there with more super proof. If, I mean, if this isn't proof of them being there, you got to come up with some really good explanation of why it is. This is a funny story. So the Furnace Ridge, um, Rhonda, <laughs> who's been there many, many, many times. So last fall, Tommy and Pam, they went on their own. And they discovered this ridge and allegedly they found this. furnaces mm-hmm. and molds. So up there, that's the alleged furnace. And these down here in the right corner are the alleged molds. Well, they came home all excited. And it was on Facebook. And according to Pam, it went around the world twice. People mocking them and laughing at them, saying that they're kerns. I mean, just, it was a mess. Just all the things that they put up with. Nobody wanted to believe it. Professional academia, especially. Yeah. Yeah. So we visited this area again, but this time with an archaeologist in our arsenal. So our guide, Rhonda, so everyone gets out of the car and they're all going up there except Rhonda. And she's sitting here like on her phone. This is her. (laughs) 
And I'm like, what is going on? Because she's like super like eager beaver. And oh, let, me, let me preface this with two, two. Because uh, I was in the same vehicle with her, and everyone gibbed out, and they're just jumping to it. And I'm, of course, getting the camera gear ready and stuff like that. And then I said, where's everyone going? She goes, oh, they're going up there to that ridge. They think that's something. I They think it's like where they're doing all these burning stuff. And I all buying. I ain't buying it. And I go, well, what are they selling? She goes, oh, you can find out. Ah, whatever. And, and she's not her. saying that to them. No, she dearly no. loves Pam. Oh, and she dearly. would not say that. But was, she's you had to know her to, attitude yeah. and just it's yeah. I was laughing at her. Oh, okay, great. I'm gonna go. You know. So she did have her unspoken doubts. She wasn't saying it out loud except when Steve asked. And she was visibly <laughs> annoyed that we were even stopping there. So she was with the rest of the academia. These are not furnaces. Like, why are we here? Can we please go on to the next place? However, with our archaeologist, um, Dr. Zalecki, inspected it, and it was confirmed these are indeed furnaces. The depth is correct. Um, he said they need to be at least three foot, and he found iron ore everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there's not just one furnace. There's multiple. It's multiple. a ridge with furnaces, and you can see the molds. And even though people on Facebook were making fun of them for the past six months, you can see somebody has shown up and put plaster of Paris in there and taken them home. That white stuff? That wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Somebody's been there and made copies of those molds. So what's hilarious, so again, here's Rhonda on her phone. I don't even know how she was doing that. There's not service out there. But she's just like scrolling. And when we are like, oh my goodness, it's real. Johannes said it's real. She's all, what? Can I be in the picture? And I mean, she is like <laughs> You're running. running. Yeah, yeah. The fastest 180 you've ever seen. The next picture shows her in it. <laughs> She's right in the, right middle, in the middle of the whole thing. I want to be in the middle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was great. We're laughing at her. We're all laughing at each other. <laughs> and then Johannes has in his hand the magnet rod. Um, we even offered, you know, because he's older and he had to kind of climb to get up in there. And so John and I offered to get up in there. He's like, no, 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 I do it. I mean, he wanted to be there. But yeah, it is, it is furnaces. So we can add that to the list of things. If this wasn't the Hebrews, you've got to come up with some pretty spectacular reasons for why for why this is here. Yeah, not just one. There are multiple of these. I mean, all across this whole top of this ridge. And again, and the molds were all over. And that other picture I didn't reference, that's new molds that we found. So they had found the one last year, but mm. while we were there, we found two more sets mm -hmm. of small molds. And Steve's going to talk about some bigger molds. This is a big mold that Dr. Zalecki, and I can't remember who was there. I know you were there. Matter of fact, we can go to the next slide because this is the same image. This is where Misty's actually doing the measurements for Dr. Zalecki. And he had already you know, got his magnet in there. There's iron ore all over it. And so there's obviously it was a mold for something. We're trying to figure out what it was. And that was Misty was stretching all over trying to get the measurements. So it was really well, funny. Well, and Rhonda's the one that found this because... Who it, was? Rhonda. Oh, Rhonda. It's hard. It's probably hard to imagine, but this thing is huge. It's, yes. it's probably like this tall, but it's kind of sitting on, on legs. So what we realized once we got to looking at it, so it's it's almost like if it were flipped upside down. Okay, let me back up. Right now it is flipped upside down. So if it were the other way, <laughs> right side up. it's almost like a hollow tree with a big thing. Yeah, see that? And so what would have happened is they would have used it as the mold, and then once it was hardened, flipped Flip it, it over and, and so the, that they could get it, it out, and out. then it was just left there. This is where we started finding some bigger, that was the first bigger mold, and this was, in the picture to the right, I had Dr. Zalecki look at this, and if you look at the picture on the left, there's what we were looking at, talking about it, an angel mold. And if you see the rock on top, it actually, Misty was the first one to notice it. Like this one on top actually rolled over and fit in perfect alignment with the rock that's laying ground down. You can't see it right now, but when we were there, it is in a perfect mold. They fit together side by side. And I was excited because I'm going, I'm seeing the angel here and how one of, that would fit on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And then, so I, I brought Dr. Zalecki over and he answered, he's doing the, you know, looking at it. He goes, well, there's iron ore all over this thing. He goes, he's looking at it and doing this. And the other goes, well, this is definitely man made. This, is, this has been formed here. This has been this. And so, is it the angel mold for the Ark of the Covenant? We don't know for sure. I lean very heavily to that. You can actually get a picture. It's where they would sit on, uh, how do I explain this? The they one on top. Like this, and they would have gone like that. Yeah. Together. Again, it's hard to explain it, but there were two perfect molds fit side to side. Exactly what it is, as I am looking at, I can see one arm of the, of the well, arm, but the wing reaching out. If you can see on the bottom one, where the because the, the angel wings had to touch one another. Okay, on top of the ark. 
So it's hard to say, but it's interesting to, to consider. But for sure, it is a mold. And back to what Misty said, what in the world anybody else? It, on top of this ridge, where all these fire pits, if I can say it that way, our furnaces were all there. They're there for a reason, no doubt about it. And Dr. Zalecki, oh, that's his magnet there too in, in the yeah. right. That's how he would collect his iron ore looking for things. This is the, what we consider the possible location for the first tent of meeting. It was so crazy cool because we got down off the ridge, and it was a good quarter mile, if not half mile long, the ridge of the furnaces and all the molds and stuff. And we started meandering off to the north side just a little bit. All of a sudden, there was a massive clearing of just nothing, and what you can see right there. And as I'm looking at it, I'm going, oh, my goodness. And they go, what? I go, said, it says that Moses made the tent, not the tabernacle, but a first tent of meeting off and away from all the congregation, away from everybody. I said, this is a perfect location of where he would have done it. And it's right in sight still of the Mount Sinai. And so it's like, it's all right there. And again, back from as you said, all the pieces fit together. When you read the scriptures, we just read the words. We don't think anything about it. But when you're there, you're going, oh my goodness, it's all right here. It's so exciting. So, yeah, I just wanted to bring up, it was when we were standing in this spot, we were actually with a Bedouin guy who showed it to us, because he was like, you have any idea what this is? Because it seemed odd to him as well. Um, And I don't know what it is. We don't know anything for sure. There was a rock line that was obviously man-made. Yeah, and it was just like a perfect big rectangle. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting about that spot, the reason it's burned into my memory, is because we're we're all standing there, and we all know our Bibles, and we're all like, oh, well, it could have been this, and well, is there room for each tribe? And well, there would have been three tribes on this side. Which, Which way is north? Okay, so this is north these three these three tribes would have been on this side and these on this side and one person said well, we don't know all of that and we all went yes, yes we, we do, do. <laughs> because you know our family's been reading the bible through this year as well as my 15 year old and you know we had been in numbers and man he was bored <laughs> and it was so cool to be standing there and I come home and I'm like Landon Here's what's super cool about this. All those parts that were boring that we've been reading. When you're standing in this place, all that boring stuff becomes a treasure map. It's all there for a reason. Because if it doesn't fit that these three would be here and these three here, and it tells us how many were in each tribe. Mm -hmm. We never knew why any of that was important. But when you're trying to find a location like this, it literally becomes a treasure map. He looks at numbers with new eyes now. Yep. Amen. This is crazy. This is the lava tubes. Now, um, it was Dr. Zalecki who mentioned, he goes, well, that's a lava tube right over there. And I go, what? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, and he starts talking about it. He goes, he goes, they're all over the world. I mean, there are certain places that are more dominant, this, that, and the other. And he's, he said, there's, some are thin, some are thick, some are, but they're this kind of, he starts going all the geology about it. And I'm going, okay. But as he says this, and we're looking at this one, and there's others there, I stopped. Everyone else is talking, and I'm just, I'm walking away and just kind of, Talking to myself, I'm going, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, this is a lava tube. Oh, my gosh. And you're probably saying, what's the big deal about it? Well, let me read a story for you real quick. Number 1628. Then Moses said, regarding Korah, this is how you will know that Yahweh has sent me to do all these things and that it was not my idea. Verse 29. If these men die a natural death and experience only what usually happens to men, then Yahweh has not sent me. But... If Yahweh brings about something totally new and the earth opens up its mouth and swallows them with everything that belongs to them and they go down alive into Sheol, then you will know that these men have treated Yahweh with contempt. Well, we all know what happened there. Could it have been a lava tube? I don't know. But wow, what a potential interesting option for that to be. Starting to wrap things up. Misty. Okay. So now that we've covered the locations, we just wanted to circle back to the map. You know, again, it's one thing to see individual photos, but being there and being able to orient yourself to where all of those things are. Again, the pink one is the crossing. The green one is Elam. The blue is where um, uh, Jethro. Jethro lived. So again, for him to go visit and tell... Moses, hey, you're doing this wrong. <laughs> you, you need to appoint leaders. You're making it way too hard on yourself that it's all right there. Um, and then we're going to zoom in a little bit. So from top to bottom, this is just showing you where these are in relation. Steve's kind of covered this too. So just real quick going through it. The one at the top is where the snake rock is. Then the split rock. Uh, I think we've actually covered all of that. Yeah, we did. I hate to cover it again. Yep. Yeah. 
Next one is Neom again. Just to remind us that Neom is right there. And it's, there's a reason why there's an urgency to get all of this documented because we're, many of these pictures can never be snapped by anybody again because it's all already gone. Since seeing and experiencing these locations firsthand, I feel I'm doubly accountable for the information that I share. So in addition to the research I've seen over the past 17 years, I've dove in even deeper since being home and having firsthand knowledge under my belt. So some of these things I could not be more sure of. Some, I still have questions. But what I do know is that I don't need to defend Yah's word. It can stand completely on its own and be proven true in his perfect timing without my help. In my opinion, Yah has preserved and protected his mountain in the dry, remote, desert climate of Saudi Arabia, the perfect conditions for his purposes, while hordes of people have visited St. Catharines in Egypt for centuries. Set apart, set aside for his purpose and his timing, just like he does for each one of us. Another thing I know, no other proposed location for the mountain has even a handful of supporting evidence let alone the mountain of evidence that we've shown today. May the same Yahweh who led the stiff-necked Hebrews through the sea and then the wilderness continue to lead each of us through our seas and our wildernesses, and may we meet him at the mountain of his love with thanksgiving and worship and proclaim, yes, we will be your people and you will be our God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's it. I think we have two more slides, but one is a Q&A. Amen. You can give the Lord a clap. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> if we can have some house lights, and I know we don't have any mic runners, so if, you, if anybody wants to ask a question, we have five minutes left to do some. Oh, we have some questions already. So, all right. If you can just make it loud, unless we can get a mic run from somebody. Real nice and loud. And if I can keep it quiet so I can repeat for everybody. So the inscription of Moses that Johanna, was there any interpretation? I actually talked to Pam about that two days ago. Real quick. The oh. question was, in case you didn't hear it, the Moses inscription, was there an interpretation to it? And she said, you know, it's not, um, it's not linear. You know, they're just kind of characters. So they don't know what it says. Um, they only know for sure the time period and that... Whoever wrote it was extremely educated. So her memory of that is what it did in Johannes' heart and in his mind. Back during the back. So the burial site, is that going to be uh, demolished as well? Or is it, was it too remote? Will there be the area that you said, or are they going to build on top of that as well? At the burial site of the 3,000? Oh, all of it's threatened. If anything, the burial place is actually closer to the reservation, to the new location they're doing it. And were y'all able to take artifacts since it's not, I guess, holy ground? or no, th Nothing is like that. Now, because it's a burial place, that might mean something to them. I don't know. But there's coughs all around there. So in that light, that might mean something they don't care. I don't, I'm not sure. Everything is in jeopardy, in my opinion. Got one down here in the front. Uh, and Jethro's tombs. Jethro tombs. Were those natural or man-made? Oh, those were all man-made. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. There's, you got carvings around it. You got the, the walk-ins. They're completely 100% man-made. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Very they're, impressive. they're Nabataean. So you've seen Petra, like in Indiana Jones, Last Crusade. Mm -hmm. You know, the city that's built into the cliff. It's the same architecture. Very much. Yep. One more right here. Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. It's black on top. Question. Great question. Not that we know of, but however... Because we're, we're stopping, or we're driving along, Pam, uh, Miss Jed said, that rock on this mountain here looks just like the top of Mount Sinai. And then, uh, well, I don't think so. She goes, oh, no, it does. It looks just like it. So we found a mountain just like that, and then she made the driver pull off, and she, went, she took about a five-minute walk to go find the rock. And then she brings it back. She goes, no, it's different. You know? So it's like there's, there's differences. But now I'm not a geologist to say what's this is what's that. And even when we got up there, you can see very much, it's a dark, dark, dark green up there in different areas. Yeah, and as we're climbing Mount Sinai, you can see it. But when we got to the top, the green was separated from the black. And I should say charcoal area, you know. And you can see and there's some spots where there's rock where it's, you know, broken. And you can see where it's charcoal around the sides. Now, to say, could that be anywhere else? Possibly. But again, it's when you put all of the locations together, everything matches to a T. It's just insane. Any other questions? Okay. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Let's pray.
Father, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you. Father, this has been such a joy, one to be a part of this team, and Father, you get to share it. And I pray, Father, for all of us here, that we don't just take this day lightly, that we take what you allowed us, this team, to be a part of and pray about it. Because, Father, there's a reason that you bring everything to light, and especially now in these end times. It seems like things are just getting crazier and crazier by the day. But you show how even when you have your people up against a wall by way of an ocean in front of them, and we may feel we have no place to go, you're showing us you will always make a way for us when we walk in your ways. May we never forget that. Be with us now, Father, to go our separate ways. Keep us safe until the next appointed time we ask in Yeshua's holy name. And everyone agree by saying amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you again.